Yes! Guys, welcome to another episode of Three More Points. Although I should say, welcome back to Three More Points. And it's basically a, a fresh start. Now that we have got multiple cameras, we have got Harry, the greatest guest in a live stream in history. According to you lot, you are interested and fascinated by him. So I thought, what better way to bring back the Three More Points podcast than by bringing Harry in. Makes sense. As a Chelsea fan here on GBFC, welcome to the channel for the first, like, proper official video. Like, yeah. this, is, this isn't just like a live stream where we can eat katsu curry, chat nonsense about watching Chelsea lose over and over again. Mm. Welcome to the channel. Thank you, mate. I've got a good little topic for us to discuss today, which actually comes from watching Nini's video this morning. Mm. So watching Nini's video, and he's talking about whether Chelsea have spent a billion quid the wrong way. So we're going to kind of engineer this in our own way, but it's a really good video from Nini. You should check the link in the description. I'm going to leave a link for it so you can go and hear his opinion on this one as well. Chelsea have spent a lot of money, mate. We've done a few streams together now. We have watched a good result against Luton. We've watched a horrible result against Nottingham Forest. And in between all of that... That's fine. Just, just come in. It's fine. We don't mind. All right. Brilliant. Big Christopher. We're doing a video. Yeah. We're doing a pod. Oh. <laughs> we spent a billion. Yes. What do you think about that? Just top figure off the top of your head. How does it feel to be a Chelsea fan watching a team in 12th last year, in 12th now, having spent a billion quid? Yeah, it's horrible. It's the, wor it's the worst thing ever. It just makes you the target of all, all the abuse, firstly, because, you know, nobody, nobody wants to be a fan of the team that spent all that money. I mean, let's let net spend net like it's net spend. Well, you do if you're winning. Yes, but not when you're losing. But even when you're winning, like all our lives as Chelsea fans, pretty much we've experienced that. You know, you've bought your success, and so now we're buying. We're spending even more money, but we're like doing worse than ever. Yeah. But I think, I think the thing that worries me most about it is like is what we've spent the billion on, because it's not going to guarantee success, but it's still a billion pounds. It's what would you say we have spent a billion on then? Well, we obviously invested in a lot of youth players, which is great. I love, I, you know, we, we both play football manager, we both play FIFA. Who doesn't love a wonder kid? Like, everyone gets so excited about a young talent that can come to your club and progress and shock the league and do things you, you weren't expecting and then also be your player for the next five to ten years or whatever it's going to be. But the thing, the, thing that, the thing that troubles me about it is even when you look at the other clubs in the world that, that have a similar, like a, a, I don't want to say a similar model, I don't think this has actually been done before when I really think about Not it. to this extreme. No, least. that's the point. Like, you even look at Borussia Dortmund, which is like obviously renowned for producing these like amazing young footballers. They still have really talented players in their ranks. They've got the boys that have come through. They've got their Marco Royce. They've got, their, I think Witzel plays for them right now, does he? Matt no, no. Hummels. Witzel's at Atletico Madrid now, but he was there. Um, you know, Robert Lewandowski wasn't young when he left. Um, they've yeah. always had like big name players in within that mix, and so I don't think this has been done before. And you'd think, oh well, we spent all this money, and the quality the quality is there, perceivable quality in these young players is there. And you'd think, well, okay, we might not win anything for a while. We might we might not get top four, but we're going to get like high finishes still. We're still and we're going to yeah. progress. But we actually there's no there's nothing to suggest that's the case. There's n there's nothing and. I just think managers talk about experience all the time for a reason. How many times over the years have we had young players coming through the academy and we always said, oh, it's just the academy players not getting, being given their chance? Or was it that the experienced player that was ahead of them had something that they just simply didn't? I mean, I saw an interesting take the other day on Twitter or X, whatever it is now. Like, it was on X. So, again, take whatever you read on that platform with a pinch of salt. But somebody put a picture of Maurizio Sarri up on the screen. The context around what the Sari picture was representing was he was the last man to play players in their correct positions, mm. which I think in itself is a debate because Maurizio Sari famously moved N'Golo Kante out of position yep. to accommodate for Jorginho, who was renowned as being his guy. So if that's the case, how can Chelsea have spent a billion <laughs> yet still start this season? with players playing out of their natural positions. And why do, you th why do you think people are talking about this so much? Is it Pochettino's fault? Or is it simply when Pochettino looks at the players that have been given to him, all through pre-season, Pochettino was saying, we need some experience. We need some experience. And after, you, you literally, you could fill the GBFC notebook one whole page with the players that we brought in, and there is no experience whatsoever apart from 
Nkunku and Sanchez, who are the only players I think above the age of 25. The Nkunku one is, I, I, I just can't stop thinking about it. Every time we're playing, all I can see is that gaping hole where he would have been. And he brings the goals and the assists that we, that we desperately need. And yeah, like in that sense, maybe the strategy would have worked, but it just yeah. shows you the, the problem when you have such like a, a thin squad. Like you still need experience, even yeah. in the depth. And, all, and also, the other thing about experience is players learn from experience. We've got Thiago Silva in there, right? Which is amazing for those young defenders. And arguably, the young defenders are actually doing a lot better than the young attackers are. Yeah. And I think that, I don't, I'm not saying it's because of Thiago Silva. Maybe it's just easier to be a young defender. I don't know. But for sure, like, we've been all right defensively for a while. We're not too bad defensively. Yeah. But, but going forward, we are... We are, we're not good to watch. I mean, we're a bit of a mess. I think we've nailed it though. Like I think when you say maybe it is the fact that we set up pre-season with Nkunku, Pochettino was absolutely loving the Nkunku, Matson, Jackson. Jackson. Yeah, it was great, wasn't it? Link up. And I think again with Matson, it's been an interesting one because this is another fascinating discussion because Ian Matson is a player who could have easily gone to Burnley. Chelsea were seemingly shunning him, shoving him out of the door. Yeah. And then Matson was like, well, no, I want to stay and fight for my place. And I think realistically, with Hall gone, Matson is probably, the way that Chilwell's playing, only got a few weeks, potentially, before he's even given a chance. And then I think he is that kind of player to take that chance straight away. Mm -hmm. So with someone like Ian Matson, is it going to be a case of, well, if Matson's going to get minutes at Chelsea, it's at left back because Chilwell's not playing well, or... Is Pochettino so strict now on if we don't have Nkunku, we're going to be using these not Mudrick players in the left wing position? So for me, I've said this in my last couple of videos, there's no way that Chilwell can start in this like left wing, inverted forward, whatever this role is, well, I, can't happen again. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, so, there's just so much to unpack here. But like one thing that has been annoying me is like people saying, oh, Chilwell should be dropped, but he's... Have you ever seen Shaw play left wing in your entire life? Ever? I mean, we, we've discussed this too about positions on the field, right? Yeah. Especially Chelsea. When you look at a graphic when they come out on television, it's very rarely anything like what they even line up on the pitch like. <laughs> but with this team, I'm like, I don't really know what the formation is. And I think you've explained it a lot better than me all the times that you've been on the channel so far. It's a back four right now, isn't I'm it? I'm less patient than you are. <laughs> That's, you're trying to like, give people the better than that. I'm like, it's a back four. It is shut a back up, four. Shut up. It, it, no, you're right. But I think people immediately will see De Sassi, Silva, Colwell and be like, right, three centre-backs. It's in possession, field. though. But I, I don't know why everyone's getting so annoyed. I, I, think just, I think everyone's just traumatised from like our years playing with a back three system. But the reality is like all the big teams are lining up with a back three at the moment. Like I've seen Liverpool do it, City do it every game. Yeah. So I, don't, I, I actually view it as Poch being like tactically relevant, to be honest. Uh, but personally, I just, it just isn't, it's not fitting together right now. And, yeah. and I, for me, I don't understand why that back three has to ha include De Sassi right now. That's, that's actually one of the big problems for me. It does seem like the weak link. Like it, I, I mean, it, it's, stop, it, for me, it's stopping Shua being a left wing back, basically. Yes. That's the so problem. What would, you, what would you suggest, not, not for the whole team, but like yeah. if you were to... Right, going into next game. Next game yeah. that we play against Bournemouth yeah. away next Sunday is so far. Yeah. Why are you doing this? Why play us on Sunday? <laughs> Give me a Friday night again, okay? As soon as Chelsea lose an international break, I want Friday night kickoffs. What is the, the goalkeeper? We'll talk about him in a second because yeah. this is another fascinating one. Yeah. But the defence line or the defenders that start the game for Chelsea in this game, yeah. who are they for you? Chilwell, Colwell, Thiago Silva, and, uh, and presumably it'll be uh, uh, Malagusto if James isn't fit. I'm glad that we are in unison with and that. And it's too. obvious. And, but the thing for me is I know Malagusto is, is a younger player than De Sassi, less experienced, but everything I've seen from him, looks, he looks great. Like, he, he's, got the, he's got the recovery pace, and we need that in our back three, for sure. Yeah. And you could argue that it makes us airily a bit more vulnerable. And to be fair, against Forest, they were actually quite a big... We kept saying during the game how big they, they were. They looked tall. Yeah. So actually, we kind of needed De Sassi's height. And then when you start breaking it down like that, you do actually understand what Boy Potter's done, what he's done, like the logic behind yeah. it. But I think the big, the big problem for me that we need to sort out, and, and this defines the team selection, is, is how do we attack? And right now, yeah. we are desperately missing a player that links midfield to attack. We're, we're desperate for it. There is just a, a gaping hole that is just every time... <laughs> every, every time... Not that kind of game. Every time... <laughs> 
We go forward. It's just so disconnected, and there's so much space between the players. Yeah, there is. But and then so you... you and so you got to go right. How do we fix that? The, right now, with the signings we've made, with the injuries we have, the only option is to play Cole Palmer at ten, in my mind, or Ian Matson. But yes. but Palmer preferably because he has been signed to play as an attacker. So. so then, if you do that, then you play with two in a midfield pivot. Then I yes, guess. because definitely in order to for Cole for Cole Palmer to play as a number ten, yeah. then you can't have a three man midfield. Agreed. And I'm thinking. And the, the issue in the Forest game was that Gallagher, Caicedo and Enzo were seemingly playing the same position. Yeah. Not a single one of them understood what a role was. So when you, you, you look at Enzo, Caicedo, Gallagher playing in the same spot, trying to do the same things, basically on top of one another, Caicedo couldn't give it to one of the two of them because they literally stood right next to him. Mm. So then Chelsea's problem against Forest wasn't necessarily just having that connecting player between the midfield and the attack. It was, can we get the ball up to the top of the pitch without crossing it again. Well, look, but like, look, we watched every single preseason game together. We did. I was so excited going into the new season because there was clearly a plan. It was clearly working because we played really well in preseason. Yes. And you could see there was depth in each, each of the positions. I've not once, n- not one minute at this season so far, in the Premier League season so far, have I seen what we did in preseason system wise. Nice. And it's because we've lost our tens. Yes. It's because we've lost our tens. Now, I, that, that first game of the season, admittedly, we could have played with a 4-2-3-1. We didn't have to do the De Sassi, you know, all that stuff. But I think it's because Nkunku was gone. Maybe Poch didn't fully trust, trust Chukwameka yet, and he only was just starting to play well in that second game. Like, yeah. he, didn't, he didn't do much in preseason, realistically. He was one of the lesser, less impressive players. Yeah. I don't know, man. It's just so irritating because I feel like we were, on the, we were on the cusp of something in preseason. And I know it's preseason, but you, it, it worked. It was working. The machine yeah. was working, and I know yes. it, I know it's preseason, but it was working. So but I think we did this a lot last season too, where when Tuchel was sacked, I feel as though the immediate reaction was, "How can you just stack a guy like this after a couple of bad results?" We found out later on it's probably something to do with the ownership not looking at Thomas Tuchel as a guy who could be their guy to be like, right. We're going to go down this path and do things this way. Yeah. Are you happy with that? No. Oh, okay. Well, we kind of can't fire you right now because that is suicide for us to the fans because they love you. Yeah. And then at the start of last season, there was a couple of things that weren't really lovable, so they could get rid of him. Potter is then supposedly that guy. But then you look at Graham Potter, and what I see with Potter is a bloke who would have just been delighted to be at Chelsea in the first place because, well, he's at Brighton. <laughs> And then he goes to Chelsea, which now actually isn't any more the sarcastic look at the camera and be like, it's only Brighton. Now they've done something a bit special. That doesn't work either. You get Frank back in. PR stunt, again, most likely, as much as I didn't want to believe it at the time. Yeah. Now you've you got Maurizio Pochettino, who also has been a guy who has had difficult people to work with. Now, you wouldn't say that these new owners are difficult compared to a Daniel Levy, for example. We just spent more money in one window for Poch than they spent for him in 11. But I think, like, you just brought up the number we spent again, and, like, I think that's where the disconnect is for me right now. We that's sp- what we've got to figure out right yeah, here, be- right now. Be- because, yeah, and, and, and I guess, like, the question is, is it acceptable that we're missing players still after a billion spent? It's unacceptable. And I think the reason this season could end up being one of these topsy-turvies, beat Luton 3 nils. Next week, we go and flip in lose to a forest. The problem is there's no one worse than Luton. That's there's the problem. no one worse than Luton. <laughs> so- and West Ham battered us, really, in the second half. Like, But again, they didn't batter us in the sense of like we were getting pummeled and had to defend. And like, we're they just talking ex- about... We exposed our weakness that, you, that you've brought up before, which is this inability to... Break down to, a low block yeah, team. Exactly, exactly. Break down a low block and, team. And, 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 you know, a guy like Moyes, that's like his bread and butter, isn't it? Like, soak yeah. up the pressure, counter-attack. Like, he's, old, he's been around for a while. He knows how, exactly how to do that. He's a dutty boy. He is a dutty he's boy. He's a dutty boy. He makes it difficult. And he loves it. So, with that being said, then, we both acknowledged that experience was needed. I think that's a universal agreement that we could literally just aimlessly go down that rabbit hole here in this video. But another take that I find fascinating about analyzing Chelsea's spend, and then obviously on the surface right now, results get analyzed in conjunction to that spend. So right now, every loss is massively, sometimes maybe overdone in Mm. terms of how bad. Because we spent that money. Mm. That's going to be the case for everyone analysing Chelsea all year because it sells. One billion in the title. I've done it for this YouTube video too. (laughs) (laughs) Shameless. It's it's true, but it's like, it is shocking. And you have to acknowledge that because can 
Chelsea, a lot of people have said, now that we spent all of this money, we have got a team for the next 10 years. You've got a Enzo, Lavia, Caicedo midfield that you could see for 10 years. Football does not work this way. It's never been this way. Real Madrid, look at what Real Madrid have done. They bought in Jude Bellingham. Did they get rid of Modric and Cruz? This is a great point Nini so made in his video. Damn good as well. That is what you do. You keep experience to bleed in the youth, and yep. then it's a seamless transition when these players aren't being asked to come and absolutely revolutionize and take over things today because they've had the yester guys easing them into things. Yeah. But Chelsea aren't going to be able to just be like, well, we spent a billion. And now we're 10th. We're a mid-table club now. No, we're going to have to spend money again if this doesn't well, work. Well, I, I saw... Uh, I'm, I'm so happy we have Pochettino, by the way. Because I really think, like... I think he's the I guy to, to work with these young guys. And, and I'm about to use the phrase set the standard. Because he's got that experience of being in big dressing rooms. But I saw a podcast with John Obi Mikel a little while ago. And he was talking about when he arrived in that... Big Obi. Yeah, big Obi, mate. When, and he was talking about when he arrived in that Chelsea dressing room. And he was like... When I got there, he was like, they didn't accept me at first. And mm. there were so many standard setters in that dressing room. And he was like, it took about a season for them to actually like welcome me, like proper welcome me and accept me as a player yeah. that, could, that could help them and do something for them and, and be part of the success. But like, you know, there was that, essentially it was like a cartel of players that were experienced who were just desperate and hungry to win. And it was like, you had to earn your spot amongst them. Who, there's nothing, there's no, there's nothing to, you walk into that dressing room and it's like a free-for-all at the moment. It's crazy. It's almost like Thiago Silva is that dad who's just had like so many kids with so many different women. I know. And he's basically got to just... And let's be honest. <laughs> this whole daddy role for everyone. Yeah, and let's be honest, like, he is like, he seems, this is my perception, he seems like a lovely bloke. He does. He seems really nice. But like, I don't think he's got that, that sort of steel in him that JT had or like Lamps or like one of the, or like those guys who were in there and were probably like maybe not even very nice to you for a little while yeah. while, you, while you were proving yourself. I no, think he's, I don't know, I don't know, I might be completely wrong. Off I the think mark you're with right that, though, I think you're really onto something. I think it was like an acceptable collective. Yes. Where it's like just when about. you're accepted, just, just about, yeah. then you're a part of the collective, which yeah. at the time was incredible footballers across every position in the field. Whoever the new kids on the block are, they're coming in to fit around Czech, Terry, Lampard, Drogba. Mm. That was a universal, those are the four. For 10, 15 years, done. Not yeah. 15, 10, roughly. And in each, and, and in each unit of the pitch. Exactly. Which is so important. Exactly. So when Chelsea were hiring, firing managers, I thought we'd hit the jackpot when Luis Felipe Scolari <laughs> comes in. I think we won 4 0 on the first day. And yeah. then within a couple of months, that was kind of the. Deco. Deco, bro. <laughs> Big Deco. Like, he was just the guy. But this For is about a month. <laughs> you bring players like that in to fit around those four aforementioned. Whereas now, Enzo Fernandez is taking the armband before Thiago Silva. And I'm going to say this off the cuff. I've not heard anything about this. That's ridiculous. But I think that that is probably Thiago Silva being like, look, guys, this is going to be your guy now for the next 10 years. But not trying to put together a whole midfield, he's going to be the guy. Enzo's the, the, the glue for me now. Give him that role. When James is out injured, not surprised. Chilwell, not surprised. Then Enzo takes the but arm. What back. frustrates me about that is there's been no process for which he's had to prove himself in terms of like, it's just for some reason being decided he's the guy. He seems like he's got a lot about him. Yeah. But like... So it's, much pressure. It's a lot of pressure, but it's... Yeah, there's no one to share that with. He'd come in and it's like, right, you're the guy now, good luck. Yeah. It's mental. And I mean, it's, it's, it's off the back of winning a World Cup. Clearly, probably being a vocal guy. He's tenacious. He, he's got like, again, it's just it's, it's one of those words that we use that we don't really know how to define in football. Grit. Yeah. Like, he just seems to be... I think it's someone who shows like... In. But I think it's someone who shows that like constant Passion. on the pitch aggression yeah. and work rate. And it, it's, it's those two things, basically. And it's like, it's... You know when a player doesn't have it. You see it all the time. Yeah, a Heads passive passenger to the rest of the team 100%. who doesn't facilitate starting things. Yeah. But I think, like, talking about that, though, that's something we need right now. We need steel. And, like, looking at the team the way we're playing, like, what's a bit frustrating right now is even though I know he seems like he's not fit, but Kaiseido's not fully showing that for me. Like, that's yeah. why there's, like, a debate between him and Conor Gallagher right now. Because, objectively, yeah. I know Kaiseido's got what we need in terms of, like, what kind of player yes. he is. But right now, for me, Conor Gallagher's showing a few of the things that... He's just fitter. I think it comes down to that. He's fitter right yes. now, and he and he really cares. He like, does, and I think that's also another point that we probably don't have a lot of. We love, I love Chelsea players right now. Mm. So in that case, it brings it's it back to the money spent. That are fit anyway. Yeah. Like you, you're desperate in a way. The club seemingly desperate to get rid of Gallagher 
any price, not any price, but like for a certain price at any opportunity, you bring Caicedo in, how much influence is there going to be from these guys at the top to play Caicedo over Gallagher, even if Caicedo keeps making high profile errors, Gallagher keeps on developing his game, keeps getting better, keeps performing better than Caicedo. Is that going to be one of the, the points where we need to wait a bit longer this season to see it? But like, if that is the case, what does this say about the way that the club are moving forward? Is it going to be the academy is dead? Nah. Well, firstly, I think this international break is a massive period for Caicedo. This is his chance to get super duper fit. You'd hope. He's got to. He's got to. I hope so. He's got to. He I'm just, worried. Because the last two games he's played, he's been at fault both times in possession. He's lost yeah. the ball and they've gone and scored. You know, if you're going to play with that possession and that pressure that we want to play with, you can't be losing the ball at the base of the midfield. It's just, it's not acceptable. It can't happen. Yeah. And it, But look, I, I've got patience for him because he's young and he's got, he, we know he's got ability. He does. But, but, the, prob I... but the problem is, is, George, is that we can't, as much as they are all young, we can't keep saying, oh, they're young, because otherwise we're just going to accept mediocrity for a long time. At some point, they've, they're going to have to belie their years and deliver. That, that's just like, otherwise we're just going to get frustrated, aren't we? So who's going to be the one who gets... Is, this, this is the, the real interesting thing and why I wanted to bring it back to the money spent. Yeah. Who's going to be the ones who get cut? Yeah, okay. That's because a good question. the owners... In what time... Give me a time frame, like... Like, are you asking me, like, in two years, who do I think is still going to Let me paint the picture a little bit first. Go on. The owners said they want to have... They didn't say these exact words, but they basically wanted, like, a legacy manager. They wanted someone who could be there for a long time, build a project. They're Fergie. They're Fergie. But Fergie. maybe, hopefully. That's always been my dream. You guys on the channel know this. Then you've got record-breaking <laughs> transfers who might not actually be as good as we thought they were because they were playing in a really well-oiled Brighton team in a great system. Not writing him off, just hypotheticals here. So then, who Cucurella, is the yeah. one... Cucurella, even better example, yes. Who is the one who gets the axe? Because eventually, the project has to have like an overarching like mission statement, right? And I think that should be, that should be a manager who's backed. But then, I also remember being here a year ago, thinking Graham Potter was the best thing since sliced bread when he won four out of his opening game. Yeah, Pochettino's but, had a worse start than Potter did. Yeah, then. but Pochettino's got the pedigree. So... Does Pochettino have the nous right now to see that what he's doing isn't good? Is he going to be worried that if results don't turn quickly, because we've got a horrible run coming up after the next couple of games? Yeah. But who's the one? To, who are the ones to go here? Do yeah. we just sometimes admit that we're spending a lot of money on players that aren't right because it's his project, or does the manager go again if this keeps getting worse? I want to put that one back on Yuji because I know I know what I think about Chelsea's culture, about managers backing them, sackings, and the quality of some of the players that we have. So yeah, I want, but I'd rather you answer that to be honest for now. I think it's at a point now where I can actually look at this squad of players and think we've actually spent a lot of money on players who are absolutely not ready to deliver Chelsea Football Club what Chelsea fans believe we deserve right now, which is challenging. For Premier League titles, winning trophies, and we're not even in half of the ones we're normally in, which is Super Cups, because we win the bloody European thing. We're in no European competition. We're in three trophies this year. And I look at the squad that we've got right now, and it is so flipping young that I can't say with any confidence, having seen enough of this, this season already, mm. this isn't me jumping the gun, writing off Poch. I don't think there's enough quality right now output-wise in this team, to win Chelsea anything anytime soon. So with that being said, you're absolutely right with what you say about Pochettino, that you're glad it's him who's in charge. Because yes, he does have a great track record of developing young players, of working with a squad, maybe even finding certain roles for some players who maybe didn't think that was going to be what they were going to do before. And I think, again, the squad is big. It's not really what Pochettino wanted. I think it's four outfield players more in this squad than he would have liked. you got players like Malang Sarr still at the club on 100 grand a week, which is flipping mind-blowing. And we've still got six centre-backs ahead of him. I think there's, there was a lot to be said about how good the clear-out was. Big Malang. <laughs> Big Malang, bro. <laughs> Why is he still doing here? Like, I just don't... You've got certain sections of the fan base calling for the owners, saying, like, they're just rubbish. They're running the club into the ground. It's, it's, it's a disaster. 
You've got some people already questioning Pochettino. You've got some players being scapegoated. I just think overall, what we have done is actually mad, but it's whether or not the levels to which we have gone down this path of youth, experience, build for the future, that's the part that I think right now Pochettino is going to struggle to get the best out of this team right now with. The fact there is an experience, the fact that there is not enough players on the bench who have got a little bit of understanding of how to not just see out Premier League games, but chase a Premier League game. How can the players that we have brought in, who clearly on paper, you're looking at some of the reasons why we bought some of these players. We're talking like high percentile defenders with their tackles, their long balls, their passing, their crossing, whatever. Like we bought in quality. But in terms of the balance of experience, youth, it isn't there. So for that reason, I think as fans, we have just got to get used to a different mindset right now. And I don't know how it's going to be beneficial to us as fans to go in on the owners and say they've got it all wrong. Because they have invested it, a lot of money. But like how, how wrong have they actually got it? Because one, if like I'm just playing devil's advocate here. If, That's why you're on the pod, mate. It, <laughs> If Rhys James and Nkunku were fit right now, if how different does it look? If yeah, we're talking about a Rhys James who can't stay fit for more than sixty minutes. So is it should we have prioritised Gusto and another right back? Now I'm playing devil's advocate here too. Not not positionally, but I'm talking about in terms of that blend, that profile blend. Yes, yeah, Rhys is so important to the he attack. He is the best right back in the world when he's on on form and when he's fit. That, I fully agree with you. So with that in mind. They probably looked at the makeup of the squad. They probably looked at the makeup of the squad, and they've gone, "We've got Reese James at right back, who is unbelievable, and he and he has got good experience now for his age. He, he does. He, you can't really call him a young a young player in age, but not a young player in terms of the experience. He's he has. one of the most experienced players in our team now. I know, and he's you know he's done his seasons in the championship. He's won the Champions League. He's captain of the club. He's come through the youth academy. He knows what Chelsea's about, and he's, he knows what the Premier League's about, and he's shown his quality. So they probably looked at that and they're gone, "Okay, Thiago Silva." Experience. Yes. He is experienced and he's still quality. He's still good enough. Yeah. Ben Chilwell, experienced. He Benjamin is experienced. Bloody Chilwell. So that's, that's, th so that's three players in your defence that will start most games in the Premier League, okay? Midfield, yeah, that's, that's actually... I'm, I'm, we'll break it down right now. We're, we're pretty, trying to figure out what the issues are. Midfield, there's not enough experience in midfield, full stop. And Poch no. said that in pre-season. And they spent 300 mil. <laughs> yeah, which is crazy. No! Which is absolutely insane. But maybe they're looking at... I'm just trying to, again, playing devil's advocate. Maybe they're looking at Enzo and going, this guy's got enough experience, which he doesn't. He's barely played any club games. He's got but more than enough quality, I believe Won the World that. Cup. Yeah. yeah. But, and then you look at the front three, and it's so inexperienced, except for Raheem Sterling. So, again, there is an experienced player there. So, yes. so I think they've underestimated the injury issue some of those players have. That's kind of at the crux of it. Yes. And they've overrated some of them as well. And I, yeah. So... So, so I guess the question here is, we're talking about this billion spent. How wrong have they spent it? Maybe it's not actually as far off the mark as, the, as, as everyone would have you believe. Maybe it's just a little bit unlucky as well. There's an element of that in there as well, for sure. Nicholas Jackson, I think, is the perfect segue within this topic to dissect a bit more of here. Because Nicholas Jackson is a player that I think Chelsea fans already adore. He's shown more than enough capabilities on the ball and off the ball to suggest to me that he is exactly the type of striker that Chelsea want. Another fascinating thing that I've seen, again, a bit of a disparity between the way that Chelsea fans are viewing him, is people think he's like Drogba. Some people think he's like Nicholas and Elka. And I think between just both... Be both. Just, just be both. <laughs> but this is what I'm saying. I think Nicholas Jackson potentially if he relaxes a little bit, yeah. could actually be a really great combination of both of those two players. So then you're looking and you're thinking, well, Raheem Sterling has impressed a lot of people this season. The Athletic are writing articles about how he's reborn again. So how can Chelsea be getting beat by Forrest, be 12th in the Premier League table, and there be a huge, massive meltdown again with fans and rivals just putting us in the mire? Chelsea in January... We're going to have to spend some more money. That's what I think we're going to have to do. And I think the player that Chelsea need to buy is so close to Chelsea already, geographically, with where he plays his home football on a Saturday, Ivan Tony, mm. I think would solve so many issues that Chelsea have right now. Putting the ball in the back of the net, 
not leaving Nicholas Jackson having to run around like a headless chicken thinking I've got to score for Chelsea Football Club because if I don't, we're going to die. It's kind of what's happening at the minute. He gets five chances, might bury one of them. The other four, it's just a bit faffy. That's an awful word, but it works. It's faff in the final third. Did you watch his Diary of a CEO interview? I absolutely did. I watched it on my flight back from Kuala Lumpur, mate. What a fantastic insight to a bloke who's ice cold. Yeah, so I want, what do you think about him? I think he's ice cold, bro. I think this guy has screwed up a little bit, but nowhere near the levels to a Mason Greenwood level of a screw-up for public scrutiny. Of course, of course, of course. But Ivan Toni, I just think he's going to... I believe... You know when you can just look at someone and you actually believe what they're saying? When he says he's going to come back from this ban that he's had right now for gambling issues, I think Ivan Toni's going to be a better player than he was before. In terms of his ability and, and, and his, he's proven in the Premier League, which is exactly what we need, and we need a goal scorer. We do. It's just so clear as day. And, like, I, and I, it doesn't mean that Nicholas Jackson won't be the striker anymore either because they can interchange, they can play together for sure. I'm, I'm convinced Jackson can play a, a two up front and come deeper and do the defensive work as well of a wide player or even play left. Yeah. So that's not a problem. And that left wing is a significant problem right now. But that, we can get to that. But uh, my, my one thing, though, with Tony was I'd never actually seen him interviewed before. There was just something a little bit avoidant about him when he was answering the questions there was something a little bit about him where I was kind of like this isn't I don't know there's something that just didn't sit quite right with me in the way he answered some of the questions I agree but I also I mean? think like when it's when it comes down to like acknowledging that you're obviously banned for something you've done wrong yeah you don't want to come across as being like well yeah I know I got it wrong because then it's like bro like you're banned like we know what you've done like, yeah it's okay so then you don't want to come across as like oh the feel sorry for me guy but at the same time, he, it, was, it seemed difficult for him to open up. But I think in his own way, it was such a great interview from him with the way that he conducted himself. Because I genuinely think that's just the way he is. Mm. Like if someone, you know this because you make great content about trying to like draw stories and emotions from people. By the way, Harry's links are in the description if you want to see more of what this guy does. But Ivan Tony, he, he, he said it himself in that interview. I'm not an emotional person. I don't show my emotions. And I think when it comes to, like, Chelsea's problems, we are very emotional, in a sense, if you can compare, like, build-up play in football, because we're trying so hard yeah, that's actually good, to yeah. squeeze everything out of it. It's anxious build-up play. It's anxious. Up play. Yeah, it's like, it is. well, we can't get it through there, so we're going to go around. The... No! Stop yeah. putting it around there and stop trying to put it across there again. Someone needs to be ice cold, killer instinct in front of the goal, be that when Jackson's blazing it over from three yards, or just being like, look, guys, get me the ball, I'm going to score you a goal. Yeah. And I think Eve Antoni has everything that Chelsea need well, right we are, now. Well, we, are, we are still making chances. Like, I, I saw the stats you put up in your last video where it was saying we've got the third highest XG in the league or whatever. Yeah. You know, some of those Jackson chances, I think an Eve Antoni would finish. Yeah. You know, so we are creating chances still, even though it looks pretty bad. I mean... We're still having enough chances to not lose to Nottingham Forest, even though, yes. even though, even though like, it was yes. bad. Um, do you think the reaction would have been different if we'd have, say, drawn 1-1? No, nah, I think it would have been as bad, probably. I think so. Because everyone's so afraid of what happened last season. Yeah. Everyone's it's... so afraid of that being the standard again. Like, it was so bad to watch last season. It was, it was impossible. And it was so clear how unhappy everyone was. Yeah. And so now you want that, like, fresh... Like, you remember, do you remember in preseason when you put a video up where... You were you you titled it. It was like Pochettino has lost control of, of, yes, of the dressing room, I and do everybody went this. in on you. And it was because, and that wasn't what you were saying. You were suggesting that he doesn't have enough say on who comes and goes. Basically, yeah, that's what I remember. What, what I was saying. But people were like George, the negative energy, and I think it's because people are just like genuinely like traumatized and shook from last season so much. Yeah. They're like, we don't want to hear none of this negative energy. Yeah. Just bring us positive. Vi we want positive vibes only. Yeah. I really, I really think that's like I think the fan base has just had enough. So like, as soon as things aren't looking quite right, everyone's freaking out. But so do you think we need that now? Like. We both said that Pochettino is the right man. Give the man some time. I think now that the club have gone through Potter, Bruno, Tuchel and Lampard in one year, having said they wanted to keep somebody there, there's not really anybody better, in my opinion, than Pochettino nah. right now. Nah. I mean, De Zerbi is going to keep raising his head because he's actually such a good manager. But I think we just have to stay away from Brighton, steer clear from there, just be like, OK, let these guys come and... Get close to us, because they are. They're, they're doing very well. They've got some great players. Well, it's, like you, it's like you keep saying, everything's set up there for people to succeed. It is. Everyone's got to find roles. Deserby yes. went and built on what was already there. So we yeah. don't have a clue what he would do coming into Chelsea. Like, 
We need to figure out what the hell we are. I don't want us to fire Pochettino at all this season. No. I'm going to say that right here, right now. As long as we stay up. Because, <laughs> I mean, I know that I will... I know, this, is, this is the thing, right? When I make a comment like that, I have to vindicate it with a serious explanation. The only reason I'm saying that is, let's say, for example, when you look at our fixtures, I'll put them up on the screen for you, October through to December, it's atrocious. It's absolutely atrocious. Based on the way Chelsea are playing right now, I don't see points here right now. But I do think Pochettino is the right guy to not only understand his flaws from what we have seen early doors, but to also come up with something. Like you said earlier, he's at the moment trying to be relevant with the way that City have pushed John Stones into midfield. Trent's gone into a midfield position for Liverpool. So maybe he's seeing Chilwell as that's our guy to do well, something like this for well Chelsea. Well, that three defender thing does let you get another man forward, actually. It does. And it has for Chelsea yeah. right now. But with Ben Chilwell. But I do think... So be that guy to know it didn't work. But are you... like this? I guess, sorry, this is a bit of a segue, but like, are you, how excited are you for Lavia to be fit? What does, what does he solve? At the moment, I don't know. Like, I'm excited for him because I'm excited for any new player to come in. But I'm also excited to see if David Washington come on, comes off the bench because <laughs> he's still here at Chelsea Who? and didn't go on loan. <laughs> You see, like, this is the problem we have. We've got so many pieces still, and I don't know how it fits in, but you've spent so much money. You've got Pochettino here. He's clearly a good manager from what he's done at Spurs, what he's done at PSG, and even Southampton, I think, is an amazing story that shouldn't be forgotten amongst those two other yeah. minuscule clubs that we've aforementioned. But, like, realistically, I think Maurizio Pochettino... He's also coming across as like a little bit, well, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to be here when these guys come good, when they enter their primes. They're all 22. He knows they're going to be brilliant, possibly, in four years' time. I think he's the best manager on the market for us right now to make sure that they're brilliant at Chelsea. You know, you know before we were speaking about like who gets the chop, does the manager survive? Yeah. Can we, like, can we do like a percent scenario where we like think ahead three seasons? A percentage scenario? No, no, no. Sorry, a hypothetical scenario. Oh, I love well, this. Well, we, well you, you think ahead three seasons. Okay. Who do you think of the current crop will still be in the Chelsea squad? Who do you think is still going to be there? Because like, I don't think some of them... I just already think some of them aren't good enough. Yeah, I think... I mean, it's, it's, I think it's easier Sorry, to... Sorry, who's going to be gone and still be there? I think most of them will still be there. But like, yeah, who do you think Hypothetically, in three years. Yeah. So in 2025, how, do you, how does Pochettino's Chelsea How do you work? envisage these players developing? Do you think, which ones do you think are genuinely going to make it and which ones do you think are just like, because clearly part of the strategy is, look how, much, look how much money we spent this window on young players. Like, there's guys we bought for like 20, 30 million that like, they've not even, they've barely even been at Cobham for like two seconds. Like, yeah. it, we, spent, we spent so much money yeah. on so many, so clearly the strategy is, buy all the best young players and see which ones make it. Like that hasn't really been done to this extent before. Never, so maybe it's crazy. It crazy. Yeah, but it's going to take time. But are yeah. we good enough in the meantime? That's the question. But that aside, the ones that are in the squad right now, which which ones do you think won't be there in three years? I mean, okay, let's go. Let's start from the top. Yeah. Goalkeepers. Because age ain't going to be an issue. They're going to be retired, except Thiago Silva. There's not big <laughs> retirements. Goalkeepers. Like I want to see Petrovic play. Like I don't know enough about him, but I've heard great things about him as a goalkeeper. Sounds a bit like a pad of check as well. But, so, you know. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it's just, it kind of aligns with, with that pipe dream of having pad of check reincarnated again. Mm -hmm. um, defensively, Levi Colwell, I think, is going to be a world-class top two, top three Premier League defender. Could go down as one of the best ever if he keeps the trajectory that I believe that he will. Big shout. Badi Yashil, I think, is a really good defender as well. Great player. I think he's solid. The question is, can Chelsea manage to put two left-sided centre-backs together in he'll, a team? He'll, he'll be, I think he'll be the right-sided centre-back when he comes back. I think so too. I hope so. Mm -hmm. I really hope so. And then the midfield, Hang I on, think... Well, what about, uh, you've got Ian as well. Ian Matson. Yeah. If is he going to get chances at Chelsea? If we're calling him a defender. Is he going to get chances? Wesley Fofana? That's another one. That, like, Wesley Fofana? That's another one. We've been unbelievably unlucky. Yeah, but then injury, these injuries, look, footballers are getting more injuries all the time because they're playing so many football games. Yeah. So I don't think, I think there is, the, the, that correlation is undeniable. But then you also add into that that Rhys James, Ben Chilwell, Wesley Fofana are all injury prone players already. And I think if I'm being brutal, to suggest that in three years time, they're all still going to be at Chelsea is crazy. Yeah, Rhys James who, can't stay fit. Yeah, but who, which ones are not going to be there? Right, so which ones are not going to be yeah. there? Out of that bunch you've just said, any, oh yeah, Cucurella, bro. No, he can't be there. Right, so Cucurella's gone from defence. Cucurella's gone. Sanchez is gone. Sanchez is gone. This is right now. Yeah. This is such a hard one, but it's such a great thing to do. 
De Sassi, I just think, like, I think De Sassi is a 38.8 million centre-back from Monaco. Yeah. And what I mean by that is... Like, he is exactly what he says on the turn, yeah. Yeah, I don't yeah. think he is going to be like a Vidic, Ferdinand, Ch Cavallo, Terry. Like, Chalibur. No, Chalibur, I think he's going to be gone because gone. I think he deserves to play football. Malagusto? Malagusto, I think he's really good. He'll yeah. be there. Midfield. Midfield. Enzo Fernandez, I think, is world-class already. Moises Caicedo, I think, also... Given some time, we're going gonna, gonna, gonna to have to keep him eight years to get him amortised enough to get, to get the money back anyway. <laughs> Can I say, though, yeah, I'm going to back him for now. I really am. Lavio, I also think, is class well, we too. Seen him. We can't say anything about him. We haven't seen him yet. But I think he's good. I think he's a good player. Yeah. Conor, Conor Gallagher. Gallagher. That's, that's, that's the one that's probably the... I, I love Conor. I do. I think he's a good footballer. But I just think, again, like, eventually... He's up against it. He's it? up against it. He's he's up against midfielders that Chelsea spent a lot of money on. Yeah. But there, there's a massive onus when you spend a hundred million on a player to play them. Also, when you look at the systems the big teams are playing now, there's not many teams that use his style of player. No, but what is his style? That kind of box to box midfielder. Like I don't. I don't he's not a deep player. He's not. He's not technical enough to be. The, in my mind, he's not technical enough to be the ten. Yeah. He's not. Um, He's not quite got the defensive now to be the, d the defensive midfielder. He he's great at both, but he's not excellent at either. Correct. So I think he's a box. He's a box to box. He, yeah. He, you know, moving between six and eight for me, uh, maybe ten sometimes. And I just don't think there's any teams right now that are really. I mean, I think Liverpool actually maybe would have worked before when you know when they had he could have been a Henderson replacement potentially or something like that. Yeah. When the midfield was the engine room for them. I don't actually. I've not really watched them much. So I don't. I don't know how they're lining up this season. But, what about Big Leslie? Uh, <laughs> Uguchuku, I, I have no idea how good he is. <laughs> I don't know anything yeah. about this guy right, really. So, so probably not. So you think Connor will be gone? I think Connor will be gone. I but think Santos will be gone, not because he's not very good. God, but I completely I just, forgot about him. There's so but he's many not in the squad players, right now. Bro. He's not in the squad. Yeah, we won't consider him. But that, actually, but that isn't isn't that weird though that Ugo Chuku ended up staying and Santos left, even though Santos featured heavily in preseason. Yeah, and Santos impressed me. I think what I liked about Santos in particular was the fact that he would just seemed to be able to be very balanced. Yeah, in yeah. What is not balanced? He right didn't now. do anything flashy. He did the hard graft. You didn't see him he too did. much in the game, but everything yeah. he did was correct. And so. that's what made us excited about Enzo yeah. because you saw Enzo getting a bit further up the field again. And I think that's what we wanted from him. We wanted him to be making that final killer pass as opposed to the pass before the pass, which yeah. currently right now, that guy who makes that pass isn't there anymore. I, do you know what? I think this could have been a whole discussion in itself about who stays and who goes. Well, the, the ones I wanted to get to were the attackers, really. Let's talk about the ones who actually stay okay. as well, opposed to everybody. Okay, fine. I'll give you the names right now. In three years' so, time, okay. who's still going to be So here. you think it's more players will be leaving than staying? Cole Palmer will still be here. Because I think he's a quality footballer who Pochettino will develop and get the best out of. Okay. Nicholas Jackson, I think, is a fantastic striker. Good talent. And I think Noni Madweki could become really good. Mm -hmm. That's it. You think Sterling will be gone? I think Sterling will be gone just because the pace of the Premier League is changing all the time. The, the one... Well, okay. And the, I think he'll be gone. Uh, what about Chukwameka? Chukwameka. Chukwameka. And Kunku when he's fit. And Kunku when he's fit, yes, will stay. And I think... For Khans, I think Nkunku is so good that maybe he's just not going to get enough time. Mm. So I think Chukwameka might go because he wants to play football. The, 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 the big one, the big talking point, the most controversial player right now in our squad for me is Mudrik, Mikhailo Mudrik, because there is this fandom around him that for me is just completely unjustified. I think it's because people just get really excited when a player is fast, to be honest with you, because I have not seen anything from him so far Except that one goal in preseason, which was blinding. But other than that, I've not seen anything from him that makes me think he's good enough to play for Chelsea. I just think a player like him, it's a catch-22 here, because a player, he needs to be playing, first of all. Deep down, there's an issue with, when it comes to his understanding of whatever Poch is trying to ask him to do. I think even before he was injured, when he missed the last game or whatever it was, if Pochettino believed that what he was asking Chilwell to do, Mudrick could do better, yeah. then Mudrick plays there. I don't think Pochettino necessarily is picking Bro, Chilwell there. That's how purpose. bad it is. Chilwell's playing left wing out of position. Yeah. So I just think we Mudrick spent a hundred million. What was it? Ninety, a hundred million on Mudrick. It's eighty mil. But this is my point. I think the Mudrick issue is he needs to be playing football to improve and to develop. But he's not trusted to play right now <laughs> because I don't know what he does other than just it's, sprint. Yeah. So I think Pochettino is so he'll a bit be... screwed with him. So I don't, I don't think he'll, he'll be at Chelsea at all. In three years. From what I've seen so far, which is why this is brutal, and it's like people could take out of context everything we're saying here. But I just, from what I've seen to date, 
Mudrick isn't going to be at Chelsea in three years' time. Yeah. Good, sec- good moment to move into something else, I think. I think so. Or it could be a good moment to wrap up. We don't want, it's an international break, bro. We, got, we, we don't want to give everyone everything now and then be there in a week's time. Like We're true, bored true. and we're out on the piss every day because we've got nothing else to do. We need to save some contento for the mandem. We contento. For you guys watching yeah. at home. If you've made it to this point, then you're an absolute legend because this is a long upload from me. If you do enjoy the Three More Points podcast and you want to see more of it, you know what to do. Hit the like button on this one. Subscribe if you are new. If you do want to watch it or listen to it, should I say, on Spotify or iTunes, you can also do that. The link is in the description down below. Harry, George. it's been a pleasure, my friend. I don't know if anyone... Oh, we got this camera as well. God! Ricky, top man. Ricky behind the camera is doing the business. We've got Rick. this one here as well. If you guys did enjoy this and you want to see more of it, then let us know in the comments. Let us know your thoughts on all the topics today. Sorry if you had anything else to say. I'll just cut you off massively. I actually have loads to say, but it's fine. Because we want to do another one. <laughs>